Good morning and welcome to church. It's so fun to see Christopher's kids acolyte and pull the bell and do all those kind of things. It gets me all teary. So welcome to church today and we're happy to have you here. Um, I have a couple announcements. Everything's in the bulletin or has been projected. But just a note, next week for Sunday School, Jordan Heater is going to be here with his wife and maybe his two kids. I'm not sure. He attended Zion for several years and now they're going overseas into ministry. So he's going to share about that next Sunday. Um, if you haven't picked up your communion, remember to pick it up here. We have the individual cups. And, as you know, Pastor's on vacation in Spokane with his family, and of course he took the kids to Gonzaga so they could have their pictures taken with the bulldog and all those exciting things. So that's great. Um, one thing I wanted to mention is that I do have cataract surgery coming up, which is why when Pastor has said, oh, the elders are going to be reading and they'll be doing all that, it's like, mm, no, not me. <laughs> so, I've got my notes printed really big for myself, so that's why I'm not reading at times. Um, I also want to welcome Pastor Walls and his wife Lori and his family, his kids. I taught with his son Robert and his daughter Kelly when I taught at Zion for 21 years. And as I told him, or I've told them before, my son Andrew was supposed to have Kelly in the eighth grade, and then she quit to have a baby, which is wonderful. James is here. Um, but it, it was, I was like, what? That's not the right timing. Mean, you were supposed to wait another year. But we have James and his sister Michelle, and they're just fabulous, fabulous people. Um, Pastor Walls was a chaplain in the Navy, right? And he actually served um, for a few years where Jack Floxbart was. Yeah. Uh, Zion up in uh, Yakima, Washington. Up in Yakima. And he's been at Zion here for a year, and now they live here. But it's just wonderful to have you come back and, and be with us. So with that, I don't think I have every, anything else in my notes. So let's begin. Thank you. The grace 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear to my pleas for mercy. In your faithfulness answer me, in your righteousness. Enter not in judgment with your servant. For no one living is righteous before you. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the work of your hands. <clears throat> Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Hide not your face from me, lest I be like those who go down to the pit. Let me hear on the morning of your steadfast love, for in you I trust. Make me know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. God wants us to be certain about our standing before him. In today's passage from Ephesians, we are reminded of God's good intentions for us personally. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world. This passage, however, does not give us the right to judge others and their standing before God. During our time of silence today, we reflect on the ways we have fallen short by being too quick to judge others. We confess, Lord, we confess that we have missed the mark, wanting us to claim our position before you. We have instead focused on where other people should be in their standing with you. Too often we have kept track of the shortcomings of others and their faults. Too often we have found to keep track of the goodness you daily provide right before us. Give us a new heart today, one that trusts you to be the judge of all living things. God, our heavenly creator, hears the prayers of all people and answers those prayers. Our prayer for forgiveness is answered in the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who died for our sin that we might have new life. The distance between God and ourselves has been brought together by love made perfect in the sacrifice of Jesus. To those who believe God's word of truth comes the power to be the people of God. Praise God for the gift of love to us. Amen. We continue with the hymn. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, your grace is sufficient for us. When we are weak and suffering, point us back to you, our source of strength and... your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I apologize, that microphone went out. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And he said to me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you. And as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard him speaking to me, and he said to me, Son of man, I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who have rebelled against me. And they, their fathers, have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are also impudent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are of a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10. I must go on boasting though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know this man who was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no man uh, may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surprising greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I have pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel found in Mark chapter 6, beginning with the first verse. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And and he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. But you wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. 
And if any place will not receive you, they will not listen to you. When you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet, a testimony against them. And so they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated for our next hymn. for this morning is recorded in Romans chapter 6 verse 22 but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God the benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life grace be in you and peace from God our Father from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ amen well here we are 4th of July it's a time for celebration, for parades, for cookouts, for fireworks, for political speeches. Well, maybe this year not so much because of the pandemic. And the one thing we celebrate on the 4th of July more than anything else is the fact that we are free. We are free as Americans. In 1976, as a Navy chaplain, I was on a carrier battle group in the Mediterranean Sea. And on the 4th of July, 1976, sailors in their dressed whites spelled out 1776 on the carrier deck. 200th anniversary of America. What a thrilling moment that was. And the one thing that came to mind as we did that was the fact that we are a free people. And so it is that many people yet today want to come to America because of the freedoms that we have. But sometimes it doesn't work out all that well. 
In 1986, in Iran there was a young wife whose husband was in Southern California. And she wanted so bad to be with her husband. So she applied for a visa but was having trouble getting that visa and she couldn't wait. So she had her friends smuggle her into a large suitcase and put her on the cargo hold of an airplane. A day and a half later, the customs office, Los Angeles International Airport, opened that suitcase and found her dead body. People want to come to America. Recently, we have seen parents in Central America sending their children unaccompanied across the border to come here. Children, small children being dropped 10, 15 feet over that border wall to come to America to enjoy the freedoms that we all have. All of us are descendants of immigrants. In my case, my forefathers were German Russians. They were German farmers who, oh, maybe about 150 years ago, were invited by the Tsar of Russia to do farming around the Black Sea. They were such good farmers. <clears throat> and if things went well and they prospered, and then one day the Tsar said, hey boys, it's time to go to war. And they said, oh no, we're farmers. And so many migrated to the West, Catholics, Lutherans, Mennonites, and the like, and they came to America to enjoy the freedom of farming, the freedom that they had always known. People come to America for many reasons. Some come because of poverty, some become because of drugs, others come just to improve their lives and to have a better life and to have the freedom that we all enjoy. The freedom of speech and of press, the freedom of religion, the freedom from fear, all of them that we take for granted day after day. We are a free people, richly blessed by God. <clears throat> And as I speak about the freedom that we have as Americans, two points concerning the pandemic. And in the past year and a half, we haven't really felt that free, have we? I mean, for over a year, grandparents not being able to visit with their children or grandchildren, not being able to come to worship together as the people of God, not being able to go on long trips or cruises like we maybe have in the past, we really didn't seem that free. And the other point is that freedom is not totally free. It involves responsibility. And without responsibility, it can lead to license. We are to be concerned not only about our own self, but also the welfare of our neighbor. Takes back, take vaccinations. Isn't it amazing that for some, they would not get vaccinated until ooh, win the lottery, free college education, free tickets to sporting events, or if everything else fails, what? Free beer from Anheuser-Busch? It'd be more humorous if it wasn't so sad. Freedom involves responsibility, not only for ourselves, but also for the welfare of our fellow man. Now, back to the text. Paul says in our text, as he writes to the Romans, that they are not slaves, but are free. Now, <clears throat> Paul knew about slavery. The Romans had many slaves, and these slaves were made slaves because they were brought back after victory in war. And others were slaves because they were indented servants. And they would be in slavery until they were able to pay off the debt, which for many would never come. Paul himself was a free man. He was a Roman citizen. But yet he gave up that freedom 
in order to be put in chains in prison in Rome and to be executed, executed in order to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now Paul says to them that they are free from sin, which leads to righteousness and then to eternal life. They are free from sin because Christ had taken the sins upon himself. The burden of sin, the consequence of sin was removed from them and now they were righteous and holy before God and eternal life was theirs. What a joyful message to the people, no longer slaves but free in Jesus Christ. So what does that say to you and to me? <clears throat> well, let me begin with a story. And the story is about a young man named Trevor, age 26, from Baker, California. Now, Trevor was an artist. He was a painter. And one day, Trevor decided to paint a picture of a man in chains. And so to make it realistic, he went to the hardware store, bought some heavy chains with a lock and key, and then he went off into the desert to paint. Well, when he finished his work, he looked at it, oh, this was very nice. And so he went to release himself from the chains, but he had a problem. He couldn't find the key. He looked high and low, and he couldn't find that key. And after one day of searching, he finally decided what he had to do, and he hopped for 12 miles through the desert to get to a gas station to open the lock to be set free. He was enslaved in those chains until he was set free. By analogy, think of those things that can enslave us in life. Paul says that we are no longer slaves to sin. What is this that can enslave us? Namely, what can take all of our time, all of our energy, be the reason we are living what makes life worthwhile? What is it that can consume us in life? Well, for some it's accumulation of wealth. You know, we all need some wealth to live, but for some it's never enough. You have to have more money, more wealth, more stocks, more bonds, more of this and that. Well, it's not really needed. For some, it might be food. Not just eat to live, but live to eat, leads to gluttony, gluttony and all kinds of problems. For some, it might be drugs or alcohols that consume and then control one's life. For some it might be sex, for some it might be gambling. There are all of these things that can enslave us in life. Or it might be self-absorption. You know, everything is about I and me and my, that life is one continuous selfie. Or it might be hatred, racial bias, thinking we're better than others because of our race or ethnic background, thinking we're superior. Or it might be modern communication can enslave us. I think for some people, they're on the cell phone 24-7, just can't get off. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all of these things can consume us and control us in life. <coughs> And then there's the fact that we are sinners and we sin in thought and word and deed day after day. And yet Paul says to us that we are free from sin. And we look at our lives and we say, how is it that we are free from sin? And the answer for us is the answer he gave to the Romans. Because Jesus Christ came into the world, lived his life, suffered and died, rose again, and took all of our sins upon himself. We are free from the guilt, the consequence of sin, and we are now free before God in Jesus Christ. We are 
his free people. And yet, you know, when we live out our lives, sometimes it doesn't seem that way. We don't seem all that free, and we seem burdened by our sins and controlled by our sins. And as hard as we try, we really don't feel that liberated. How can we know and be certain that we are free from sin in Jesus Christ? How can we know that and be certain of it? The certainty lies in the word and in the sacraments. When we were infants and we were baptized and the pastor made the sign of the cross over our forehead and upon our heart in token that we have been redeemed by Christ crucified, it meant that from that day forward, we no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to Christ. Every time we come to worship as we did this morning, and we confess our sins, we receive absolution and forgiveness of those sins. Every time we come to the Eucharist as we will commune this morning, we receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And every time we come to worship and share our faith with one another, we do so to build each other up, to encourage each other to grow in that forgiveness that we have in Christ that freedom that we have from sin that leads to righteousness and then to eternal life. Or to put it in another way, in life in Christ, we are on the freedom trail. And the end of that trail of righteousness leads to eternal life. Well, Fourth of July, a time to be thankful, to rejoice, to celebrate. Why? Because we are American citizens. We are free. God has so richly blessed us in the land that we live in and the freedoms that we have. But more important than that is the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. We are free in Christ to serve him and to love others. We are free in Christ to serve him and to love others. And with that thought in mind about how we can live out this freedom in our world, I conclude with a prayer, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. In the name of Jesus, amen. We rise. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, but the very day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and the right hand of the Father. He will guide it in to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. We continue with our prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God and for all people according to their needs. Almighty and most holy God, we thank and praise you for all you provide us freely by your grace. We are especially thankful for the freedoms we enjoy and celebrate today as we gather to worship you, Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the leaders of our nation, state, and community. We acknowledge that you have placed them in these positions to govern us and all people of this land. Grant them wisdom and lead them to make decisions that are in line with your will for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Amid the thorns of life, we lean on your grace, knowing that it is sufficient for us and in our weakness, your strength shines through. We ask for your grace and healing for those who grieve. We ask for your grace and healing for those struggling in body, mind, and spirit, especially those for who we now name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, we live in a nation and in communities where we are thankful to have brothers and sisters in Christ, yet there are also many who have either discontinued, who have either disconnected from you and your church, or who have never known you. Lead us to share your grace with others. Guide our conversations and grow our relationships with those who do not share the hope we have. Lord, in your mercy. No matter where life takes us, we know we are in your hands. So we confidently come before you as your children and place these prayers and all our concerns in your gracious hands in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We will now celebrate the Eucharist. If you will uncover the wafer, the body of Christ given for you. And if you will uncover the wine, the blood of Christ shed for you. May this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing for our last hymn. <laughs>
You'll be seated for a moment. Oh, excuse me. Go in peace, serve the Lord. I was given something here right at the end of the service. Keys. Is there anyone in the congregation that is locked in chains yet? Is there anyone here that needs a key to open up? No, somebody left their keys. So whoever it is, you don't have to stand up now. Uh, let me just give them to somebody here on the way out. And uh, you can pick up your keys at that time. <laughs> oh, God works in mysterious ways to get stuff like that in after the sermon. It's just amazing sometimes. Uh, so, very nice being with you. I hadn't been back here for about two years. So, uh, may you have a great day, great celebration, and a great week in the Lord. Thank you.